You're now on the historic route. Today, the other Napoleon, the exploits of Bonaparte III, part one. great world historical facts and personages appear, so to speak, twice. The first time is tragedy, the second time is farce. Karl Marx. Now, I am sure some of you have heard this quote used before, but I am just as sure, like me, you never stop to think who or what Marx had thought of specifically when he wrote this. Well, today we will talk about exactly the historical figure it originally meant to describe. A member of an almost mystical royal house and dynasty with the ego to match it, a rampant womanizer, an ardent nation builder, hot-headed adventurer, cold-hearted statesman, an ultra-royalist absolute monarch who used his power to advance both imperialist and socialist causes, a man whose style and manner baffled some and commanded others, a populist who had no qualms about subverting the will of the people, a figure both obscure and acclaimed, famous and infamous, accomplished, yet nearly insignificant. And he wrote of himself, I believe that from time to time men are created whom I call volunteers of providence, in whose hands are placed the destinies of their countries. I believe I am one of those men. If I am wrong, I can perish uselessly. If I am right, then Providence will put me into a position to fulfill my mission. In the next coming episodes, we will look at the rise and fall of the Second French Empire through the eyes of its principal architect, international man of mystery, Charles-Louis Napoleon Bonaparte III. Today, we have on our hands a person of extraordinarily high caliber. But who is this man? Who is Napoleon Bonaparte III? You know, appearance-wise, nothing spectacular, yet still a bit bizarre. Standing at only 1 meter 66, he was not necessarily imposing. Brown hair and eyebrows, along with small gray eyes, a blonde mustache that protruded almost whisker-like from his upper lip, both sides pointed and narrow, also a beard resembling an overgrown goatee, a bent back, but also broad shoulders. His outward appearance seems almost at conflict with itself, you know, pompous, yet reserved. And I know I've been using these at first contradicting examples a lot now, but they just fit so well here. Like I said before, the man is a mystery in a lot of ways, and not only his looks can baffle, but also his actions, which we will look at shortly. So to finally start this show off, in this, the second episode of this podcast, I want to explore a couple of historical themes with you told through the life of this remarkable man. These 
themes will include political ones, such as nationalism, socialism, royalism, but also personal ones, such as intrigue, affairs, and fate or destiny. And they're all bundled into this fascinating story. But of course, I have to start off by providing us with some background information. And so I will begin by setting the scene of the time we find ourselves in. In 1789, the French Revolution broke out. The grandfather of all revolutions, pretty much. The trendsetter, the one other revolutionaries will model their own insurrections on. And it came with all the now considered staples of a revolution. You had mobs with torches and pitchforks, left-wing radicals, far-right counter-revolutionaries, moderates trying to hold it all together, and overturning of the old and establishment of the new. Until, of course, the new became the old and it had to go to, and so on, and so on. My point being, it was chaos for most of the time. One regime followed the next. War after war was fought not only inside the country, but also outside the country. And for almost ten years, France was bled dry by it. And as seen many times before in history, someone stepped up to fill the power vacuum. Like Lenin in Russia, Bolivar in Colombia, and Franco in Spain, a great leader in personality at best, or a ruthless strongman at worst, used the opportunity to elevate themselves to power. In this case, of course, it was Napoleon Bonaparte. A Corsican artillery officer who rapidly climbed the ladder of office to then be nominated first consul and later emperor of France. He had first used democratic institutions to further his cause, but when that did not suffice to satisfy his ever more lofty ambitions, he grabbed power, quite literally for himself by crowning himself emperor. What followed were a spectacular spectacular series of military campaigns which left him uncontested master of Europe. He brought stability and glory to his empire. You know, finally, after years of unrest internally and a falling world image, France was playing the big leagues again. The word Bonaparte came to mean prosperity, order, and prestige. But as they say, all good things must come to an end. So as we probably all know, Napoleon was kicked out of France in 1814, never to return. Except by never to return, I mean, of course, he returned shortly afterwards. And in 1815, Napoleon was back again. In the meantime, the Bourbon monarchy, the monarchy the French Revolution had initially overthrown back in 1789, well, they were back in power. But the populace hated them, and the king hated them back. Quite obviously, I think. I mean, the people of France had chopped off all royal heads they could find. Bad blood all around. Literally in a lot of cases. So when Napoleon had returned, simply the sight of him made people flock to his cause. Multiple times, armies were sent to capture or kill him, yet every time these armies, on the side of their old and still very much beloved emperor, just switched sides immediately. Here's how author Higgins describes it in an article on the matter. Now, however, Royalist troops barred the way. 
the 5th Infantry Regiment had taken their positions as the enemy approached, and as the vanguard of Napoleon's forces came to a halt, a tense silence fell. As the sun set, lighting up the western horizon, Napoleon strode out in the open. He was unarmed, yet he showed no fear as he surveyed the line of gleaming rifles before him. For a moment he stood quite still, his face inscrutable. Then, without taking his eyes away from the royalist regiment, he seized the front of his coat and ripped it open. If there is any man among you who would kill his emperor, Napoleon declared, here I stand. Some accounts differ as to exactly what happened next, but most agree on the fundamentals of the event itself. After a moment of silence, voices within the ranks of the 5th Regiment began shouting, Long live the Emperor! As the cry spread, it was taken up by more and more of the Royalist soldiers. Before long, they had lowered their weapons, and en masse, the entire regiment joined Napoleon's army. For me, this action alone makes Napoleon worthy to be compared with classical greats such as Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar, or Alexander the Great. You see, their presence, or even their name alone in some cases, held immense power. And in a certain way, Napoleon Bonaparte had become the essence of France and all that it represented. But alas, it was not to last. Only 100 days did Napoleon rule again before he was so decisively beat again at Waterloo. This time, gone for good. And again, the hated Bourbon monarchy was restored afterwards, and their rule was cemented for good now, and their woes were finally over. Ah, but who am I kidding? This is 19th century France, after all, so they had about 15 years before they too were kicked out again, for the third time. And after they had their chance, Louis Philippe, technically also a Bourbon, but from a different side of the family, which made him acceptable to people, came to power in 1830. Think of it this way, same house, new coat of paint. And it is here where we start the story of now still young Charles Louis Napoleon Bonaparte III. So who is this Charles Louis Napoleon Bonaparte III? Quick interjection here before I try to answer the question. French names for royals can be very confusing. They are almost all named either Louis, Charles, Napoleon, or Bonaparte. And our man today just so happens to be called all of them at once. So just for clarity's sake, I will from now on just call him Napoleon III. Although the title, the third, will only be officially bestowed on him later. But in order to make this all a bit more comprehensible, I have chosen to call him that from now on. Good? Good. Okay, so who is this Napoleon III? Born in 1808 to Napoleon I's brother, Louis Napoleon. I know, what, what gives with these names, huh? He had to flee, along with the rest of his family, to Bavaria after the emperor was exiled for good. And for the first part of his life, he remained there. Actually never losing a slight German accent as a result of growing up in a German-speaking country. A fact for which he will be mocked later on in his life by the French elite. But these years were not only formative for him when it came to his accent. He was also tutored there by a certain Philippe Lepa, a close friend of the late Robespierre, architect of the Republican terror. Strong democratic and republican values were instilled in him at a young age, something that will mark his career significantly. So, when he was 15, he and his family moved to Rome. Napoleon III will later claim that his time there were his most formative years. For two reasons. 
Firstly, he spent a lot of time there with the Carbonari. Who are the Carbonari? Well, they were a secret Masonic-type organization dedicated to liberating a, at the time, fractious Italy into one. Strong Republican and Democratic sentiments flowed through the group, along with an intense dislike for Austrians, who at the time controlled most of Italy either directly or indirectly. And this hanging out with the Carbonari will later get him into trouble, for which he has to pay by being forced to leave Italy soon afterwards. But before we get to that, let me talk about the other thing that was so formative on young Napoleon III. His, let's say, passion for women was discovered there. And when I say passion, I really mean passion. Let me tell you, this guy will take the word womanizer and carry it to new levels. Had they had the internet at the time, they would have undoubtedly been numerous or even an overwhelming amount of like top 10 most eligible bachelor lists with his name firmly on the top spot. Gossip shows would be ranting and raving about his latest exploits. You think modern day royals get too much attention for doing little things? Well, with the things I'm about to tell you, you can just imagine the coverage on this guy he would get today. So, where do I even start? Well, he said this of himself. It is usually the man who attacks. As for me, I defend myself. And I often capitulate. I often capitulate. That's putting it lightly. Here is a short and definitely incomplete list of his most interesting affairs throughout his life. He dated a famous French artist, an exotic belly dancer, a renowned spy, the most popular at the time French actress, a daughter of a German noble, a wife of a rich British officer, a French countess, the wife of his then foreign minister, another spy, this time expressly sent by a foreign government in order to report on his personal life. Imagine that, being that famous for your sexual appetite that people start factoring that in to their political considerations. But it doesn't even stop there. Oh no, he also had an affair with his cousin, you know, as you do, who he would later in the story actually go on to make his second wife. Okay, so who was his first wife? Well, his first wife was a Spanish noblewoman who he would go on to marry for political reasons. And I just love this. When he first met this Spanish noblewoman, he reportedly asked her, what is the road to your heart? To which she answered, through the chapel, sire. Not exactly a match made in heaven, but that had not stopped him before, and it also probably explains why he would go on to have two wives in total. But this is all yet to come. The important bit is you understand what kind of guy this Napoleon III was. Don Juan, without the looks, but all the results. So, back to Italy. After, as I had previously mentioned, getting in trouble, for spending time with the Carbonari, he will be kicked out of Italy by the Austrians. An incident that would color both his views on Italy and Austria. His next stop, France. Now I had left off my brief tour of French history with the coronation of Louis-Philippe. And exactly in this time, April 1831 to be exact, Napoleon III will make his way back to his home country, finally being able to return after his exile. Now, it's not like King Louis-Philippe wanted him there, but he pretty much tolerated him for the time being. You see, King Louis-Philippe was much more liberal 
than his predecessors and so wanted to at least give the illusion of being welcoming to all. Also, his regime was fresh and shaky, to say the least. But things quickly changed. On May 5th, 1831, a massive amount of people flocked in the streets to mourn the 10-year anniversary of Napoleon I's death. Huge crowds gathered to the event. People genuinely seemed to mourn their late emperor, who had so completely captured France's imagination. Now, when this public display of support for the old emperor was over, two people drew the same conclusions. Both the king and Napoleon III started to understand that the name Bonaparte still carries the immense weight that it used to, and that the masses yearned for the glory and prestige and stability of the old empire, whether ever only fictional or not. So the king could no longer let this pretender to the throne stay in France any longer. And for good reason. You see, Napoleon III had been immensely impressed when he saw a parade for the late emperor march underneath his hotel window. And then he knew his destiny. From then on out, this man's persistence and sheer willpower will have him stop at nothing to become the next emperor of France. But let's take a step back now and first talk briefly about the Bonapartist movement in a whole. What even is Bonapartism? Well, simply put, it's the political movement or desire to restore a member of the Bonaparte dynasty back to the French throne. Now, this movement had also had ardent supporters from the very first day of the Bourbon Restoration, but it had only grown in strength and vitality over the years. And as previously mentioned, a sort of consensus still existed within the country to the effect of, wasn't everything great under Napoleon? Wasn't everything just better? And why couldn't it be so again? under a Bonaparte. A lot of this talk, if we are to be cynical here for a moment, is nothing more than nostalgia or maybe misguided romanticism for the glory days. I mean, France had seen almost continuous warfare under the Bonaparte regime. The country's sons were sacrificed to the altar of Napoleon's ambition time and time again. Spain, Egypt, Russia, and countless more campaigns that ended with the deaths of many for the glory of one. Like I said, that's the cynical view. But there is also the rose-tinted glasses view. That being that, yes blood had to be shed for France, but look at the result. France had recuperated from its revolutionary downward spiral. It expanded its territory massively, bringing in new economic markets and development potential. The country was more unified than ever. Class divides were mostly bridged by a common struggle. If nothing else, one could be proud to be a Frenchman at the time. And if history has taught us anything, it is that this desire for patriotic pride cannot be discounted. So, schemes were hatched and machinations plotted. Feelers were extended to all the remaining family of the late Bonaparte Emperor. And there were many. And pretty much all of them, again, were either called Louis, Charles, or Napoleon. So, I'll spare you the details. All we need to know for the moment is that over the years, the options dwindled. The next in line to the throne, Napoleon Bonaparte II, died of an illness in Vienna, where he had been exiled to. Other relatives of Napoleon either died off too, or were indisposed, or 
flat out did not want anything to do with the Bonapartist cause. So by the 1830s, it had become clear that yes, our man, Napoleon III, was the top candidate, and he wanted that job. So back then to our man, Napoleon III. After this parade that was held in honor of the late emperor, King Louis-Philippe decided that he no longer could tolerate this pretender to the throne to remain in France. So Napoleon was forced to flee the country. This time, Switzerland was to be his exile. And if we imagine this whole story to be a modern blockbuster movie, this is like the obligatory training scene. You know what I mean, you know, all those boxing movies, for example. They all have a scene where the protagonist trains for the battle of his life. You know, quick cuts in the movie show our hero building up strength, you know, honing his skills and preparing himself. Motivational music plays in the background. In this case, the music choice would probably be the Marseillaise. But, you know, anyway, you, you get what I'm driving at. Here in Switzerland, he builds up his practical know-how. Firstly, he joins the Swiss army as, wait for it, an artillery officer. And this probably being an on-the-nose homage to his emperor, hero, and role model. But this wasn't an entirely empty gesture. He actually does quite well for himself there and turns out to be quite competent. He will even go on to write a manual upon the subject of artillery. But that is not the only thing he writes there. And this next thing is something that really made Napoleon III stand out to me personally. And I think it will to you as well. You see, because up until this point, he seems like the usual cliché heir to an empire, you know, lofty dreams, high ambitions, massive ego, nothing uniquely his, but spoiled, you know. Everything he did so far was all in the shadow of the first Napoleon. But here in Switzerland, he will go on to write two books that are uniquely his. First one, political and military considerations about Switzerland, second one, Napoleonic ideas. The latter one is the interesting one, Napoleonic ideas. You see, in this book, he begins to outline his thoughts on politics and government and how he thinks it should work. Well, how should government work? according to Napoleon III, or what are his core tenets? Well, they they seem a bit paradoxical at first, but they are not incomprehensible. Here's the short version. He believed that government should be based on universal suffrage and popular support, but that the executive should hold in its hands all the power. So what this is, is pretty much a dictatorial system resembling the ideal of the enlightened ruler, like the Prussians did, for example. Except, at least in theory, in this system, the emperor truly would listen to the people and be mandated to act in the national interest. Here is how the man himself, Napoleon III, puts it. Monarchy which produces the advantages of the republic without the inconveniences. A regime strong without despotism, free without anarchy, independent without conquest. And if all this talk of populist dictatorial systems makes you uneasy, and if you start to think, wait, this sounds eerily like a lot of fascist and national socialist movements in the 20th century and beyond, well, you wouldn't be the only one. Actually, 
uh, some of these movements in the 1930s actually claimed him to be the proto-fascist himself and that he was sort of the inventor of that entire line of thinking. Now, I personally think this is going a bit far, but there is an argument to be made from that, and especially when we get to the socialist part of his national socialist ideas, if we can say that, you'll maybe start making the same connections. But we will hold on to that for a second because it's time to resume our chronological telling of Napoleon III's life. So, when we last left off, our protagonist was preparing in Switzerland to become emperor. And if that was the montage preparing scene of this blockbuster movie, then this next scene would be like the second to last climax of the movie. You know, it's not yet the third act, and something bad just has to happen before the hero can win in the end. Well, something bad will happen here to Napoleon III. Let me set the scene here. Strasbourg, the 29th of October, 1836. The border garrison of this city has a regiment posted there in order to safeguard the eastern borders of France. All is quiet on the frontier. It is a far cry from the raging battles of the Napoleonic Wars. Nothing ever happens around here. I'm sure that was going through at least one soldier's head as he listlessly waited on his post for a shift to be over. But in that moment, the commanding officer of the garrison called his men together and bade his guest to come forth. There he was, Napoleon the Third, dressed in the officer's uniform of an artillery man. He proclaimed the Second French Empire then and there, with him as emperor at the head. And then and there he besought the garrison to join him. And join him they did. Like in the hundred days, the garrison was ready for the emperor, ready to march on Paris. But unlike the hundred days, the other parts of the army were not as enthusiastic. Word quickly got out about the attempted coup, and a sizable force was sent to arrest the would-be revolutionaries. They were quickly surrounded and captured, and just as abruptly as it had all begun, it was over. And so ended Napoleon III's first coup attempt. Maybe the first, but certainly not the last. He had to flee the country yet again. This time he traveled all around the world, visiting Brazil, the States, and finally Britain, where he settled for the time being. And as soon as he settled down there, the plotting began. He may not have any supporters here, but he had something far better. His charm, which he used to great effect. He managed to procure the love and infatuation of a rich married woman there who was willing to finance all his dreams about being an emperor. And there was his next grand scheme. Get this, he uses the money from his new affair to buy a ton of weapons and transport ships. His goal was to set out from the coast of England to set sail for France and convert the populace and then arm them for his coming insurrection. A splendid plan. What could possibly go wrong? On the 6th of August, 1840, he was ready and he set sail for Boulogne. Having arrived there, he once again proclaimed the Second French Empire then and there and commanded his new loyal subjects to march on Paris with him. Small problem. Those new loyal subjects? Yeah, turns out not so loyal to this strange man with an even stranger story who had just arrived from the sea claiming to be emperor. Nobody joined. People were more amused 
than concerned. And it all fell apart again. And again, he was arrested. But this time, he couldn't escape. This time, he was locked in prison. And oh, how he was mocked for this. The press teared him apart, laughing at how ridiculous it had all had been. Some called for his death, but in response to that, the newspaper, Le Journal de Debat, wrote, This surpasses comedy. One doesn't kill crazy people, one just locks them up. I can't help but wonder what's going on in Napoleon III's mind right now. I just see him telling himself that one day, yes, one day he will show them all. And show them all he would. But for now, he was in prison. And there he committed himself to the two tasks he was best at. Plotting his political return, and of course, adding another name to his already impressive list of affairs. He actually managed to get a local townswoman pregnant twice while in prison. But more pertinent to the overall story, here in prison he wrote his most famous political work. It's called The Extinction of Pauperism. Okay, why is this work so famous and important? Well, in this work, he espouses radical, for the time at least, socialist ideals. He calls for better and more accessible education for the masses, a bottom-up banking system designed to provide funds and loans for the poor, and most radically, he wants to implement independent agricultural colonies, something that put him in the same camp as anarcho-socialists. Now, if this seems at all weird to you, and you start doubting Napoleon III's motives here for publishing such works, well, you wouldn't be the only one. Because it really does seem out of place for a person such as him. I mean, this man is a member of a royal family and potential heir to vast amounts of riches, yet he spends his time contributing to the cause of socialism. While, I might add, he is also plotting to establish an absolute hereditary monarchy. What gives, huh? So, of course, there are those who say he never believed in anything he ever wrote about socialist or even left-leaning causes, that he proverbially held his finger to the sky to see where the political winds were blowing and he aligned himself accordingly. Then there are those of course, who say he believed in every word of what he wrote and that he wholeheartedly intended to fuse monarchism with his brand of socialist-esque ideas. I personally believe he had sort of a hierarchy or pyramid of ideas where monarchism was at the top and his socialist ideas were closer to the bottom. Still there, but not the main attraction. And when we eventually get to the point where he is actually pulling the levers of power and actually implementing changes, you can judge then for yourself. So whether or not his intention were honest or not, his book, The Extinction of Pauperism, became very popular during his time in prison. So popular, in fact, that Napoleon III was more commonly known as the socialist author than the Napoleonic heir at that time. And naturally, the people who loved him the most for his work were the poorer classes of France. And this had a fascinating effect. You see, Napoleon III had always had the backing of a lot of Bonapartiste upper-class royalists, but now he has also the support of the lower class. And as I said previously, some historians call him a proto-fascist. And looking at this, these arguments seem to hold water. You know, support from the masses and from the elite. 
a strong state guided by ultra-conservative and nationalist ideals intermixed with socialist policies and rhetoric. Well, whether he can be considered a proto-fascist or not, his policies sure appeal to many. And if he really was gauging the political wind, he did so correctly. Both left-leaning and Bonapartiste causes were on the rise, especially the Bonapartiste cause. During his time in prison, the remains of Napoleon I were returned to France, where bigger-than-ever celebrations were held to commemorate the fact. Books, poems, and other art was made in honor of the late emperor. The populace had now almost completely put on the rose-colored spectacles of nostalgia. No one, especially not the ruling elite, knew at the time that now the board had been set for another Bonaparte to return and claim his birthright. In 1846, after six years of imprisonment, a group of conspirators break Napoleon III out of prison. Disguised as a laborer, he escapes the prison and heads for exile again. But when he returns, and he will return, he will stay for good this time. And not only will he stay for good this time, he will also finally manage to establish a loyal and large following. And he will not only manage to establish a loyal and large following, he will use this following to rise to power and to finally restore a Bonaparte to the French throne. Well, to be exact, he will do all that and more in the next episode of the historic route. I hope you join me then.